Um, so I want to switch gears, but I do want to touch on something that Dr. Golden brought up, which is really important, which is um, the stigma that's associated with a lot about uh, a lot of the conditions that we're talking about today. So I think diabetes being one of them, heart disease being another, a lot of times people that are diagnosed with these conditions just um, feel like other people are looking at them as, oh, I must have eaten badly or I must have, uh, you know, done something wrong. I must have been a couch potato and not exercised enough. And that's why this is happening to me. Um, and I think that that's a, something that society as a whole needs to address, that there's so many different factors that go into people's individualized risk and that genetics plays a large role in a lot of it. Um, so that's uh, that brings us to our next topic, which is heart health and diabetes. Um, and we'll sort of touch on, on more of these. So let's start with some scary facts so that I know that I have a captive audience. So heart disease is the number one killer of both men and women in the United States, period. So that includes diabetics, that includes non-diabetics, that includes, uh, you know, just about everybody more than any cancer combined, any, all of the cancers combined, heart disease is the number one killer. It affects people with diabetes at a younger age. So this is particularly important when we talk about women because um, back in the day, heart disease was thought, was thought to be a man's disease because it affects men first, right? So it affects men about 10 years earlier than it affects women because women are protected until menopause. Um, but all bets are off when you're a diabetic. So we, I can't tell you the number of times that we see diabetic women who are young in their 40s and 50s who come in with heart disease because, um, you know, it sort of trumps the protective effects of, of hormones. The longer that someone lives with diabetes, the higher the chances that, that they'll develop heart disease. Diabetics have a two to four-fold increase in the risk of CAD or PAD. So CAD is coronary artery disease, which is what we're going to be talking about now. And peripheral artery diseases, um, primarily we talk about, uh, we're talking about the arteries in the legs, and that's what you're going to hear about from Dr. Parikh um, in just a few short moments. Um, diabetes is a coronary risk equivalent to known CAD. So this is something that we used to say a lot, and it's not entirely true anymore. Um, what that means, what that phrase means, a coronary risk equivalent, is essentially that somebody who's a diabetic is as much at risk for heart for a heart attack as somebody who's already had a heart attack, which is a really scary way to say that, but it's not entirely true anymore, right? So it's still true for about half of women, two thirds of men, and the, the difference is probably that over the past 15, 20 years, um, preventative therapies, particularly statins, have become so much more widespread, and so uh, you know it's not as much of a risk factor, but still diabetes is a major cardiac risk factor. Diabetics are more likely to have multivessel coronary artery disease. So if they have heart disease, it's more likely to affect multiple different vessels. And if you if they do, diabetics have a heart attack, they have a worse prognosis afterwards. So why is it that this what's happening in in the diabetic person that's making them more prone to heart disease. Let's go over a little bit of the pathophysiology of it. And and what it is 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 atherosclerosis. Um, so it, that literally means hardening of the arteries. And I think this is a really important graphic because it gives us a lot of information. So if you look all the way on the left, that's the smooth inside of a normal blood vessel, right? And then over time with, with you know, either poor diet or risk factors, you get the fatty streak, and then you get a little bit of plaque, and then the plaque increases. And that's, it's something that's happening over time um, just because of a milieu of risk factors and, uh, you know, predisposition to atherosclerosis. And this could be age. This could be a number of different factors. But just having plaque is not actually clinically significant, right? So this is the plaque that you have that's not actually going to cause symptoms. You're not going to feel it. You're not going to know it necessarily unless you look and the only way to look is by doing either a CT scan which has radiation and contrast or a catheterization which has contrast and a procedure right so a lot of times this is assumed um, based on a person's risk um, and the only way that we sort of treat this or not the only way but when when we know that this exists we are more much more aggressive about preventative therapies like aspirin, like healthy lifestyle, like statins, right? Um, the, the, these small plaques, right, the 20, 30 percent plaques that, that we're talking about here don't show up on stress tests because, again, they're not clinically significant. It's just a precursor to heart disease to come, right? Then over time, if left unchecked, it can progress to obstructive plaque, and that's when it becomes significant. And we use... Um, it, you know, when we talk about the heart arteries, we use a 70% cutoff. So something that's more than about 70% usually is, it, that's where it starts to cause symptoms. So that's when you, you know, somebody's exerting themselves, they feel some chest pressure, they stop, it goes away. That's when it's, it, you know, a, an obstructive plaque. Um, that's when the stress test becomes abnormal. That's when it usually becomes clinically significant. And then um, if, again, 
when it causes a cardiac event, uh, so a heart attack is what we're talking about, that it's when that plaque ruptures and causes a clot in the blood vessel, right? So this kind of gives you a very nice overview or a glimpse at the progression of atherosclerosis throughout, you know, sort of a lifetime, and then the end result. And like I mentioned, atherosclerosis is actually a systemic disease. So it affects not just the arteries in the heart, but all of the arteries in the, in, in the body. And so we kind of group these vascular complications into two, sort of two buckets, right? Microvascular complications, which are basically the small arteries that supply the eyes and the kidneys. And those are actually affected by, by glycemic control. So if you can control your sugar and get it into, you know, almost normal range, you can limit the amount of microvascular complications. That's not so much the case for the macrovascular complications complications, the large arteries that we're talking about today. So heart disease, peripheral disease, carotid disease, it's something about plaque in diabetics that's just not the same as plaque in non-diabetics. So um, this chart actually gives me like PTSD from medical school, so don't look at it for too long. It's just meant to be, um, just to give you an idea of how complex the interplay is amongst a, a number of different factors, which leads to um, abnormal it's called endothelial dysfunction, right? So and it, and the endothelium is the lining of all the blood vessels in your body. And so there's something that not only in diabetes, but in other, you know, um, uh, risk states that you have endothelial dysfunction, which just makes your blood vessels more prone to inflammation and more prone to, prone to plaque formation. Um, and then on top of that, diabetic plaque is also more the more unstable plaque, more prone to rupture and leading to a cardiac event. And then unfortunately, the other bad news is that cholesterol is also something, it, when you're a diabetic, your cholesterol is also um, affected. So the good cholesterol, the HDL, um, the protective effects are less. So the good cholesterol is not as good, and then the bad cholesterol is even worse in diabetes. And a picture is worth a thousand words, so let's just compare. This is not this is not meant to be subtle, right? So, um, on the left, you see what normal coronary arteries look like, and it's just again just to get a visual, right? So large caliber vessels, nice and smooth on the inside, and then on the right, it's something that we call you know sort of the diabetic blood vessels, right? So the lumpy, bumpy blockages in multiple different areas of the blood vessel, very small, tiny, tapered blood vessels, and so it just gives you an idea of it's of the sort of widespread effects of, of diabetes. This is not meant to be scary. Um, and so how does that manifest? So if somebody, uh, you know, when, when you do lead to that obstructive plaque, when it becomes clinically significant, how may that present? Um, and certain subgroups, um, diabetes being one of them, but also women and also the elderly can present um, differently, right? So you're more, the, the sort of classic chest pain story, typical angina is substernal chest pressure that's brought on by exertion or by stress and relieved with rest or nitro nitroglycerin. That's the definition of typical angina. So, you know, these subgroups are more likely to have either atypical angina or just not have chest pain at all and present either with, you know, GI discomfort, nausea, vomiting, indigestion, abdominal pain, lightheadedness, general weakness. It's just something about it not feeling quite right, right? And so we made this slide actually when we were talking about women, but this is very um, applicable today as well, right? So different matters. When there's just something about it, when you talk to people who have, uh, you know, heart attacks but didn't present with chest pain, it's just something about feeling different that brought them to the emergency room. Um, and so different matters, if you're at risk, which being a diabetic puts you at risk, if you're at risk, you know, you feel different, know your body, trust your instincts and find a doctor who's going to take you seriously and, and, you know, um, and look into it. So um, what can you do to prevent cardiovascular disease in diabetics, right? Because that's why we're here. We want to try to preventing something is much easier than treating it after you have it, right? Um, so what can we do? So the emphasis is very much on lifestyle habits, which is um, really important to note because medications are great and people can get very caught up in all the new, you know, um, the new classes and the new outcomes and the new data. But really, it's about a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. It's not something, diabetes is a chronic illness. It's something that somebody's going to 
have to live with for the rest of their life. So it's not something you can do for a month or two and feel like, okay, check, I've done that. Um, it's got to be something that's a sustainable diet, sustainable lifestyle uh, for that person. So Courtney is going to be our expert talking about nutrition and diet. So I won't get too much on that, but I do want to talk about physical activity for a second, right? So what does that mean? How much physical activity are we talking about? 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, something to get your heart rate up most days out of the week. So don't go more than two days without doing something aerobic. And if you can't do that during the week, which is really hard to do, um, especially if you're, you know, working and you're in this conference room until 8 p.m., right? It, it's it's hard to do. There's uh, the weekend warrior mentality, right? So 75 minutes of vigorous activity on the, uh, you know, one or two days a week, right? So on the weekend usually. Um, and then I really love this quote, sitting is the new smoking. It was actually coined by uh, the, per- the inventor of the treadmill desk. But um, anybody who is a diabetics in particular, the, the guidelines say that you should not sit for more than 30 minutes at a time. So shame on us for making you all sit here for more than 30 minutes, but, uh, but just doing anything to stretch your legs. And at the end of the day, any activity is better than no activity. So just do something, get up and move. Um, And then I won't uh, belabor the point about um, medications, but metformin is something that cardiologists are comfortable with. Um, It's the first line therapy. It leads to weight loss, which helps with, you know, um, blood pressure control and all of the other stuff that goes along with that, improves insulin resistance. Um, And it's something that, you know, historically cardiologists are comfortable starting metformin on their patients before you see the endocrinologist or or uh, or the internist, right? The second line agents, just as Dr. Golden had mentioned, um, you want to consider the ones that are that have the recent proven um, cardiovascular benefits and the oral version of that is Jardians. I cannot say the generic names. I apologize. <laughs> um, but um, and that's the the oral version. So I think that's something that as a society or as a community, the cardiology community is going to um, hopefully be more active in, you know, uh, feeling comfortable with. And then, um, so some of the other medications that we use for prevention of heart disease, right? So my rule of thumb is that um, if somebody is over the age of 50 and doesn't have some reason, you know, that predisposes them to bleeding, that they shouldn't be on aspirin, then I prescribe a baby aspirin. So that's 81 milligrams of aspirin once a day for prevention. Um, Obviously, if you have a history of bleeding or, you know, ulcer disease or something like that, that's something you need to discuss with your doctor. Um, And then blood pressure control, it's like all the buzz right now, right? So everybody's blood pressure goal is now less than 130 over 80, but um, vigorous blood pressure control in diabetics actually has more of a benefit in preventing heart events than in non-diabetics. And the the classes um, that we favor are actually, or not just us, the nephrologists favor as well, the kidney doctors favor as well, is the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers, the ones that end in Pril or Sartan. And that's because it prevents or it it, uh, slows down the progression to kidney disease and diabetes, and it also has um, endpoints in cardiovascular disease as well. So those are sort of our go-to blood pressure medications in diabetics. And then um, just a point on statins. So I know uh, this happened a few years ago now, so I'm sure everybody is sort of aware. But in 2013, they did a major overhaul of the cholesterol guidelines, right? And so it kind of goes back to that picture with the the progression of atherosclerosis that I showed, right? It's it's kind of you identify the risk and then there's a progression of it. So it's not so much what the number of your bad cholesterol, what the number of your good cholesterol is, although we do still look at that. But um, the new statin guidelines sort of focus on a person's risk for heart disease. And so I this the the whole guideline has the flow chart for everybody is very complicated, but actually if you look at this table, it breaks it down for diabetes in in particular. And so anybody with obviously known cardiovascular disease or anybody who's in the age, who's a diabetic and 40 to 75 should be on a high dose statin. And what is a high dose statin that's usually Lipitor 40, uh, 80 milligrams or Crestor 40 milligrams, just because I know you're going to ask. Um, and, uh, and so that's sort of our general guideline on that. And then at the end of the day, it's really managing your overall risk for heart disease, right? Um, we break down categories into, we sort of talk about the modifiable risk factors for heart disease make up about 90% of a person's risk, right? But I would argue that, um, you know, being a diabetic, high, having high blood pressure, things like that, they're modifiable, but it's not something that a person can solely prevent, right? A lot of times the genetic risk 
sort of trumps any healthy lifestyle that you have. But uh, but again, these are things that you can modify that are within your control, either through um, diet, exercise, and medications, or what have you. But um, let's focus on some of the other ones. So we talked about diabetes. We talked about high blood pressure. We talked about cholesterol. Smoking is the worst thing anybody could ever do for themselves, so just don't do it. Um, obesity and abdominal fat, again, just like with the diabetes, obesity is not in and of itself a cardiovascular risk factor. It's more like the company it keeps. So obese people are more likely to have diabetes, more likely to have high blood pressure, more likely to have high cholesterol. And it's really the abdominal fat that's the bad fat. Um, so that's what you really want to watch. High stress, high cr chronic high stress that we did a whole seminar on this last year, right? But um, that's been shown in studies in humans to, um, to have a direct link to increased inflammation in the arterial walls and increased risk of heart disease. Um, poor, poor sleep habits is actually something that young people are shocked to find out, right? But um, less than six hours of sleep in a night actually increases um, event rates and uh, people who live the longest sleep between six to eight hours every night. Um, and then depression has a strong link to heart disease and a number of other conditions as well. And then the non-modifiable things, the things that you can't necessarily control, um, age, race, family history, um, being a male, but again, that has an asterisk next to it because it's just being a male of a certain age. After Women after a certain age are equally at risk. Preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, again, something that uh, oftentimes women don't even realize is a cardiac risk factor. Um, so a lot of times this happens in their 20s when they're having babies and that 20, let's say 30s now 30s 40s when they're having babies and um and no, you know nobody even refers them to a cardiologist right um and then what are the takeaway points that i want you to to take from here so diabetes is a major risk factor for heart disease due to the increased atherosclerosis which we talked about plaque in diabetics behaves differently than plaque in non-diabetics the key to preventing heart disease and diabetes is healthy lifestyle habits and aggressive control of other risk factors. And again, this has to be a sustainable uh, sort of way of life that somebody's going to adopt, not a fad diet or anything like that. And the treatment of a diabetic patient, I really want to point this out, involves a team-based approach. Um, and regularly scheduled outpatient follow-up appointments. You don't know what you're at risk for because a lot of the cardiovascular risk factors you don't feel. So even being a diabetic, you may not feel it until it's very, you know, sort of far along. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, these are things that you don't necessarily have symptoms from until it's way too late and until you've already developed heart disease. Um, so regularly scheduled appointments and then the team-based approach because as you can see, diabetes can really affect the blood vessels in all of your organs for the most part. And so I can think of like six specialties off the top of my head that that people with diabetes should be seeing on a regular basis.